So it's been over a decade since I started doing all my different types of side hustles. And some of them have grown to a stage now where they've become my main form of income, whilst others have fizzled out. So in this video, we're gonna take a look and compare each one of them. And I'll give them more a rating based on how cost efficient it is to set up, how easy it is for someone to set something up, the scalability of it, on how far you can take this particular piece of side hustle and finally the passiveness of it. Now obviously none of these are actual financial advice so make sure you do your own research before you quit your job and commit your entire life to any of these side hustles. So with that out of the way let's get started. So freelancing is my main active form of income. It's pretty much my nine to five. And the area of freelance that I focus on is UI, UX and web design. So I actually started doing low end graphic design work initially with small local companies. And then I eventually started scaling up and I'm now working with global businesses. And because I'm very transparent with the things I do, you can check out my LinkedIn to see who I'm working with and some of the past clients that I've worked with. So in terms of cost efficiency as a freelancer, now obviously I work on apps, I work on websites, so I do need a pretty high spec laptop and that does cost a fair bit of money. But on the grand scheme of things, it's not that expensive and pretty much every time a new phone comes out, I kind of have to buy it to make sure the apps are working on them. But it's not a necessity for you to do things like this because I'm working with very specific clients. I have to provide all these different things. So for someone who's starting out, I'd say it's a four out of five. Maybe you need to buy a new laptop, but beyond that, it's relatively straightforward. In terms of ease of setup, I'm assuming that you are fairly knowledgeable on the sector that you're freelancing in. So for this, I'm gonna say five out of five. The only thing you need to figure out is whether or not you're gonna be a sole trader, which I don't really recommend, or you go into setting up your own limited company, which in itself is also quite cheap. From a scalability perspective, because you are just going to be working as an individual, um, I'm going to give this a three out of five. Now, obviously, you can take this to the next level and start hiring people once you get big enough. And for passiveness, it's not really a passive thing. So I'm going to give this a zero out of five. You're pretty much going to be hands on doing things. And if you're not doing anything, then you are not going to be making any money. So number two is the web design business. So I've got a separate video on how I set this up uh, myself. So the way this is different from the freelancing is freelancing, I'm targeting very specific clients and they know exactly what they want. It's very technical and there's a very specific requirement that I have to deliver to. Whereas the web design business side, I'm targeting more local companies where I'm offering web design and hosting solutions for people who are not familiar with the web. Now, this is what I used to focus on for the last 10 years, but as I start getting into other side hustles, the baseline passiveness is relatively low in comparison to some of that I'll mention later. So even though I think this is probably the best side hustle for new beginners to get into. It's not something that I actively work on or try and find new clients for anymore, but rather existing contacts, they just come to me and ask me to help them to build them a website and host it and fix any problems they might have. So in terms of cost efficiency, if I'm assuming that you've got your own laptop already, this is obviously a five out of five. You don't really need anything else to run your own small web design service. Most of the costs that you do incur, you're gonna pass that on to the client anyway. And in terms of ease of setup, I'd say it's probably a four out of five because you do need to have some knowledge of things like Squarespace or Webflow, but it's not difficult to pick up compared to the freelancing things that I do. And I do genuinely think anyone who's been working on it for about a month or two, and you are relatively tech savvy, so you can start selling this to local businesses, or one of my personal favorites to target are personal trainers. So from a scalability perspective, I'm gonna say it's a four out of five. 
there is an opportunity for you to scale this up to a level where you're attracting bigger and bigger clients. And when you get to that sort of level, you'll want to be turning it into a proper agency and have your own mini office set up, potentially be hiring people to help you deliver the work. From a passiveness perspective, I'll give this a three out of five. And the reason why I say this is because the upfront work of the web design, there will be quite a lot of work for you to do for your clients. Now, obviously the end goal is to keep them on a retainer, get them to continuously host with you indefinitely. Now on the high end, you're probably going to be charging 200 to 500 pounds a month for your clients but again that does involve a bit of work if they do have any issues with their website there are chances where there would be months where you don't really have to do anything but at times there will be quite a lot to work on so it's not completely passive photography and videography i did this for about two years but i decided to, to stop and focus just on the ux ui and web design side of my business. That's because it wasn't making me as much money as the other two. And also there's a lot of follow-up work to do as well. From a cost efficiency side, obviously you're probably gonna need the most powerful laptop you can get, which is a lot of money. And on top of that, you're gonna have to buy equipment like cameras, video cameras, tripod, a lot of different things are involved with photography and videography. So I'm going to give this a 2.5 out of 5. Again, for ease of setup, assuming that you are pretty good with photography and videography already, it's just about getting your name out there. So I'm going to say it's a 5 out of 5. And once you find clients, you're pretty much just doing what you know already. On the scalability side, I think it's a little bit more difficult than the UI, UX and web design side of things. Uh, so I'm going to give this a two out of five. I think there's just less of an opportunity to get in with bigger global clients. And on the passiveness, again, is a zero out of five. You're pretty much just going to be hands on doing everything. There are some opportunities for you to sell stock images. And I do know some people who have got a lot of success in that. But generally, it is quite difficult to get into the passive side of photography and videography. Now, the teaching that I do is going to be a little bit different because I do lectures, seminars, and I put together courses for educational institutes. There are plenty of websites out there where you can sign up and teach or even just talk to people online. This is a really good option if you've got a niche skill or if you speak a different language. And even if you only speak English, there's still a lot of demand out there for people all over the world who just want to engage in conversation with people who are native English speakers. So from a cost efficiency perspective, there's pretty much nothing that you need to spend money on. You'll pretty much be good to go if you just set up something on your phone or on your existing laptop. Ease of setup, again, you just have to sign up to the website, assuming that you are knowledgeable on your niche or the language that you can speak. From a scalability perspective, I'm gonna give this a zero out of five because this will be quite difficult for you to scale up into a position where you're gonna be making tremendous amount of money, but it is a good side hustle. Even when you get into the very, very high end and you're working with educational institutes, it's not gonna be a significant amount of money in comparison to the other side hustles that I'm mentioning here. And again, on passiveness, it's pretty much a zero. You're gonna to have to be interacting with students in order for you to be making any money on this. So I used to think you need to have over 100,000 followers before brands would pay for you to create content for them online. But actually this isn't true at all. A lot of companies are switching away from paying high follower accounts to create their content and switching it over to paying small accounts to make the content because it's a lot more authentic. In terms of cost efficiency, it's a five out of five because you don't really need anything else. And in terms of ease of setup, I'm gonna give this a two out of five because you need to build up your Instagram account and you also need to learn how to do content creation as well. Then you need to reach out to the brands and talk about what sort of content they want you to make, which might not always line up with what you are already doing. So there's going to be a bit of a learning curve. And I think there are also a lot of competition out there. You are all on the same platform competing for the same people. So 
is pretty difficult. And from a scalability perspective, I think there's a big scope for anyone who's looking to go down this route, because if you're creating good content and a lot of people are watching those, it can potentially blow up your social media accounts. But as mentioned before, it is going to be difficult because again, you're competing with the same people watching the same content and it is pretty difficult to go viral. On the passenger side, I think this is a one out of five because again, you're going to be creating content which isn't passive. Now, obviously, if it does go viral, there is an opportunity for you to get income from that. But from what I've seen, Instagram and TikTok, they don't really pay a lot of money for their viral content. So this is actually the passive income that I've been actively working on for the last few years. Any money that I make from my income, I basically put most of it into property. And we also try and secure investment from investors or banks to put money towards our projects for a fixed income. And I actually have a different YouTube channel where I go through how we actually go about renovating some of the properties that we purchase and turn them into livable space for our tenants. So from a cost perspective, obviously you're going to need a fairly significant amount of money for you to get into. Now in the UK, I reckon you are probably going to need about 25,000 for you to start doing something like this. And it's not going to be in London. You're going to have to be buying properties up north. So cost efficiency, I'm going to give this a one out of five. The caveat there being that the money is not gone to waste. Um, it's still left in the property but it's just that you need a lot of initial setup costs. For ease of setup, uh, depends on what you buy. So if you're buying just a property to rent out, I'd say it's probably a three out of five. There is gonna be a, a fair bit of admin work. If you're gonna be doing things like HMO, then it's gonna be a one out of 10 because there is so much for you to do in order for you to transform a derelict property into basically a commercial property for you to make money on. So from a scalability perspective, I will say this is probably a three out of five. There is a lot of potential for you to scale up in property, but it does require a lot of work. What you will need to do is buy a property, get the valuation of the property to go up, and then you refinance the property to get money out. Then that will go into a second property and you basically rinse and repeat. And depending on which strategy you make, it could take a long time before you can start scaling it to a good level. And for passengers, for me, this is a five out of five. I think there isn't really anything else that's as passive as this. I'm not doing the tenant management myself. I hand that over to an agency and I just get rental income from that. And obviously this is way more substantial than the web design passive incomes that you get. You're probably looking at between 700 up to about a thousand pounds per tenant. And for me, I just don't think there's anything that beats property as a passive form of income. So stocks and shares, probably one of the most passive way for you to make money. Now, obviously there are a lot of different factors and there could be uh, risks that might affect your earning from stocks and share. But here in the UK, you can get a stocks and share ISA where you can invest up to £20,000 per year tax free, which means you don't have to pay tax on any of the money that you earn from your stocks and share ISA. And there are some great platforms such as Moneybox, where every time you pay for something, it basically rounds up what you pay for. And then they will put that into your stocks and share ISA and you tell them what your risk level is for investment and they'll invest on your behalf. I think if you are looking to get a stocks and share ISA and you don't want to buy your own stocks and share, then this is definitely the easiest way for you to get into it. Alternatively, there are platforms like Hargreaves Lansdowne where you can set up your own stocks and share ISA and you can buy and sell your own stocks but obviously you will need to do your research on these and not just go in blindly and just buy everything that you see. So from cost efficiency perspective, I'm going to give this a five out of five because you are just putting your own money that you've already got into a stocks and shares account. Now, whether or not you make money or not from it, 
that's a different matter. For ease of setup, it depends on what route you want to go down. So if you want to go down the money box route, then obviously that's very easy. It just round up and accumulate what you've spent and put it into a stocks and share ISO for you. But if you are going to be doing your own investment, then you do need to be doing a lot of research to make sure the money that you are investing is safe. But in general, I will say this is relatively straightforward. So I'll give this a five out of five. For scalability, I'm gonna give it a one out of five. You can obviously accumulate and get exponential growth with the money that you are investing in, but that is gonna take a long time. And I think it shouldn't really be something that you rely solely on unless you are very familiar with the stock market and you are going to go down the trading route which is very different to just investing a little bit of money on the side and on passiveness i'm going to give this a five out of five technically what you are doing is just putting some money aside into a fund and hopefully that will go up there isn't really anything you need to do with it you just gotta let it sit there and grow so selling products on Etsy and Gumtree is becoming really, really popular recently. I actually tried my hands at selling digital products about 10 years ago. At that time, I was training to be a concept artist and I was trying to sell my art online. But at that time, I don't think people were willing to pay and buy a JPEG online. Not like the NFT world that we live in right now. So although I don't really have much success in this area, I do know a lot of people who are very successful in selling stickers, Notion templates, and planners, and they are doing very well. So cost efficiency, it really depends on what you are selling. If you are selling digital products, there really isn't much that you need to spend money on. But if you're selling stickers or hardware like furniture, then obviously that will go down. So I'll give this an average three out of five. For ease of setup, I think it's a one out of five. And this is because I actually think it's relatively difficult to get off the ground. There are so many shops out there who are selling very, very similar things. So unless you can really, really distinguish yourself from the rest of the crowd, and bear in mind, you are on Etsy's platform, so you can see everyone else who are selling similar products. I just think there'll be a lot of competition out there if you are going down the Etsy or Gumroad route. And on passing this, I think this is a four out of five. Obviously, if you're selling a digital product, then you wouldn't really have to have a lot of different inputs, but you might need to continuously update it so that new people will be willing to buy your product. But again, if you're selling stickers and hardware, then each time someone orders something, you're gonna have to make something to send to them. So it's less passive on that front, but what a lot of people do would be they just make it in bulk and then if someone orders, they'll just send it out. So it's relatively passive. And lastly is pet sitting. So this might be a little bit of a strange one, but you can actually make a lot of money from doing pet sitting as a side hustle. You can sign up on websites like Rover where you can charge anything between 10 pounds for a dog walk all the way up to maybe 100 pounds for overnight stay for someone else's pet. And if you're someone who is in a position where you are just working from home, obviously you can be doing dog sitting but then working on your own web design as well. So it was a great way to make extra income whilst you're doing other things. So from a cost perspective, obviously there isn't really anything that you need to spend money on. Uh, so it's a five out of five for ease of setup. Assuming that you already know how to look at the dogs and you do like dogs or cats, then it's a five out of five. And if you're scared of dogs and cats, then definitely avoid this one. And on scalability, probably a zero. You're not really gonna be able to scale this up unless you end up opening your own pet sitting store, which even then is gonna be difficult to scale to a big level. And on passiveness, I actually will give this a four out of five because you can be doing other things while you're dog sitting. You're not gonna be actively doing something for the whole duration of the dog sit. It really is just about looking after the pet and making sure they're okay. So for me, this is a four out of five. So those are all the different income streams that I have tried and either failed or have a lot of success in. Hopefully that was useful for you. And if there's anything specific that you think I should go into for my next video, let me know in a comment below. Otherwise, thanks for watching and see you next time.